Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a true honor to be here today to present this climate inequality report that is being launched on the occasion of this uh, conference. But first, maybe a, a disclaimer. I will talk about numbers. Um, so this report is largely about statistics and what we can do with them. And as we know, numbers can be key for uh, policy discussions. And on that note, I'd like to start with uh, the quote of an American president. He was then uh, running for, uh, as a candidate. And the quote goes as, uh, as this. I will seek that under my administration, the income growth of every American family is above average. <laughs> so for those of you who remember high school maths, this is just not possible. If some are above average, this means that others are below. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, really. Um, not necessarily in the context of economic growth, but in the context of climate change. And this report is actually drawing from a burgeoning literature from the scientific uh, side, from the social sciences, from the environmental sciences that look at climate inequality. So we've reviewed hundreds of research papers. We're also doing uh, research on this topic ourselves. And we come up with this report for one reason. We think, and I think this vision is also shared by uh, the NORAD and the UNDP, who were kind enough to uh, support this report, that this research so far uh, does not find enough policy translations, uh, policy uh, declinations. And so this is what I would like to talk about today. So I will first present some key results from this report and some policy recommendations. And then my colleague Philip Bote will look at two other key dimensions of, uh, that come from recent research on the topic. So let me start with some of the main key statistics that I was uh, alluding to just a few minutes ago. What you see here is the triple climate inequality crisis, as we call it, with three colors on the screen, red, green, and blue. The red bars show the inequality in relative income losses due to climate change. And this bar shows that most of these losses will be concentrated among the global bottom 50%. So that's half of the population that corresponds more or less to the poorest part of the world population that will be getting 75% of all these relative income losses. I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. The green bar is the inequality of emissions. Those who are impacted the most are not those who pollute the most. And this is also very clear from this graph. The global bottom 50% of the population contributes to just about 12% of all emissions. And then there's another inequality here, which is also key, and I think critical for when it comes to policy solutions. Those who have capital, those who own wealth, in, on this planet, the firms, uh, the financial instruments that can help us to uh, accelerate the transition are those who are impacted the least. 75% of wealth ownership is concentrating, concentrated among the top 10% of the world population. Now, back to what I was saying just before about averages, if everybody was average, then the shares of the different bars for, for the bottom 50% should be exactly 50%. And the values for the middle 40% should be exactly 40%. And for the top 10%, it should be 10%. So we see here that there are huge variations above and below these averages. These variations happen between countries, and we know we're starting to know this very well. You see here that some countries will be more impacted than others when it comes to the GDP losses associated with climate change. Those countries in red are the most impacted. But we're also starting to know very well that within countries, inequalities are also stark. They are also important and sometimes extreme. 
The poor, it is now systematically shown, lose more than others due to climate shocks. And we'll say a few more words about that in the second part of this presentation. Um, now I'd like to come to one of the novelties of this field of work, this field of research, and this is what is illustrated on this graph. You see here the carbon emissions associated with poverty alleviation, different ways to look at poverty, the extreme poverty of $1.9 per person per day, up to the $5.5 per person per day. Eradicating poverty will be associated with the construction of roads, with the construction of hospitals and schools, and this will have an impact on the global carbon budget. But this impact remains relatively limited when we compare it with the huge emissions of the global top 1%, which is presented here on the red bar. So the point here is to say that sometimes we hear in the global north messages that go like, well, in fact, it doesn't really matter how fast we reduce our emissions because everything in the end is going to happen in the global south, because this is where you know, the emerging middle class is going to explode the global carbon budget. This is just a little reminder that uh, emissions of a tiny fraction of the global population matter, and they matter pretty much. Now I'd like to turn to the third part of the climate inequality that I was referring to in the first graph that I presented. This is the inequality of the blue bars. The fact that capital ownership is very unevenly distributed. The pre previous presentation also made that clear. Access to capital in Africa, for instance, is very difficult. So this is a extreme case of what economists might call a market inefficiency. Those who have the, the, the capacity to adapt, the capacity to invest, largely underinvest in solutions, largely underinvest in adaptation, in medication, at home or abroad. And so this is why um, um, we call in this report for more government intervention to solve these market failures. And so what do we recommend? At least three key blocks uh, are discussed much more at length in this report. First, improving climate inequality measurement systems. We still don't know enough about inequality numbers beyond averages. As researchers, we propose methods, we propose new indicators, but we can collectively do much better. Second, rich countries need to honor their climate finance pledges. And here we also need to think outside the box. We need to think about new revenue sources, and we make proposals in that direction. It's not all going to happen as transfers from north to south, even though they are key, they are important. The development of national tax capacity in the global south is also uh, paramount. But here, countries of the global north also have their own responsibilities. For instance, when it comes to making sure that their own multinationals are not stealing the tax resources of countries of the global south. Fourth, it's not just about getting more revenues, it's also about spending more and better on social ecological protection. And there are starting to be very many great examples of how this can be done in low and middle income countries. And fifth, it's important as much as it's important to better measure climate inequalities of emissions, it's also important to better measure the inequality impact of climate policies themselves. And so far, we're still focusing too much on measuring the average effects of our policies, whether on the economic domain or on the climate uh, side of the policy agenda. So here, just one uh, graph to show that when I talk about thinking outside the box, this is what it might uh, mean. The global community has been discussing over the past few years about a global multinational tax deal to make sure that multinationals pay their fair share of taxes, that there is less tax evasion. Well, this deal, as you can see on this graph, is actually largely favoring high-income and upper-middle-income countries. And basically, you don't see much revenues for low-income and lower-middle-income countries as a result of that deal. And this has created discontent among low- and middle-income countries for that 
precise reason. We can organize international taxation differently. This is the moment where we are discussing as a global community about these new set of rules, and it is paradoxical in a way that there is no, uh, not enough, in fact, no connection at all between discussions on climate finance and discussion on international tax uh, reforms in, under the context of the OECD. Thinking out of, outside of the box might also mean finding new sources of revenues um, without um, targeting low and middle income groups in rich countries. Um, new tax revenues, for instance, progressive taxation on centimillionaires, as we present here, can be an option. The good part here is that with relatively small tax rate, given the huge concentration of capital, this can raise significant amount of new revenues. But there is no silver bullet to tackle climate inequalities. Let me make this very clear. And this is why we also come up with a, what we call here a matrix to help policymakers to assist development agencies to make sure that when we think about climate policy, when we think about tax and environmental tax policies, we're factoring in inequality at their core. Um, knowing that different social groups might be affected differently by these policies. So we make many uh, recommendations and proposals in the report. I will not go into the details of all of these proposals. I leave this for those of you who may be interested to have a further look at this report. And I will end now by uh, thank you all for your attention and leaving the floor to my colleague, Philippe Botta. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luca. And so as Luca has already mentioned, part of what we're trying to do in this report is to synthesize the latest research on climate inequality. And what I want to do in the few remaining minutes is to give you a bit of an insight into some of the, those papers that we're drawing on for our report. So here I want to take you back to this graph that you've already seen. And I want to take a bit of a deeper dive into two of those dimensions here, which are notably the losses and the emissions side. So Here's a result from another paper that also came out last year that tries to quantify inequalities in carbon emissions. And again, you have different population groups, which are the bottom 50, the mid 40, the next nine, and then the top 1%. And on the left of this graph here, you have the corresponding population shares, which obviously the bottom 50% correspond to half of the global population. So those are really here to put the other side of the graph into perspective which shows the corresponding shares in global emissions. So as Luca already said, if emissions were equally distributed in the world, the bottom 50% should account for 50% of the emissions. However, what we see is they're only at 10% down here, so at one-fifth of what they would have in a globally distribu equally distributed scenario. And then at the other side of the distribution, the top 1% account for roughly 15% of global carbon emissions, and the top 10% taken together are almost responsible for half of all global carbon emissions. So there's obviously two dimensions to this inequality here. There's the between country dimension, which is sort of is well known by today. Rich countries in the global north tend to pollute extremely heavily and much more than low income countries in the global south. But there's a second dimension to this, and that's the within country dimension, which is something that's coming to the forefront more with these recent papers. And it's actually true that we see that over the recent years, the within dimension of climate inequality has taken over as the main driver of global carbon inequality. So what do these numbers mean? Well, basically, they mean that we have a relatively small fraction of the global population that is mainly causing the climate crisis. And so what does this imply for mitigation policy? Well, it implies that if you want to be serious about mitigation, and if you want to do it in an equitable way, you cannot be fiddling around with those 10% down there if you're not willing to get at the big chunks at the thick end of the distribution. Which is, of course, not to say that we don't want clean energy access. We do need leapfrogging of dirty technologies. But we really need to take a look at the consumption and the investment patterns of a relatively small fraction of the global population. And that's also what the IPCC is saying in its latest report. So that's on the emission side. 
Now let's look at the damages. And this is a result that Lucas has already mentioned. And this is based on research by a group based at the World Bank. And what we see here on the x-axis, I'm, I'm sorry, those are the data points that we were talking about earlier, but uh, be with us. Uh, so what we have on the x-axis are the average income losses from different climate impacts, such as impacts on health, labor productivity, agriculture, and so on. And on the y-axis, you have the income losses of the bottom 40%, so the poorest part of the population. And what these data points now tell us is that if there was equality in the income losses, then these points here should be scattered around the 45 degree line. However, what we see is that the slope of this fitted line here is much, much steeper. Now, what's that, what does this mean? It means that the poor lose relatively more from all climate damages and from all climate impacts. So this is something that we know, and we know that there's a, a cumulative chain that leads to this result. There's inequality in exposure, there's inequality in vulnerability, and there's also inequality in resilience and adaptive capacity. And we know that we have a distribution in each of these elements, but we need to get better at routinely incorporating these things into our policies, that is to say, short-term disaster relief, but also medium and long-term adaptation strategies. And here's an example of what this might lead to. So this is also research by the World Bank, and what you see here is the, is, uh, the spatial distribution of flood risk and the economic value at flood risk. So you might say this is a reasonable metric to measure flood risk, and you might want to base your, your targeting policies on these measures. And I'm not saying that this is it's not a sensible metric, but let me show you another map where if you factor in the poverty dimension, all of a sudden the map looks very, very different. And what we see here is the share of population at the subnational level that is exposed to significant flood risk and poverty below the $5.5 line. And you see that we have regions in the world where 80% of the population suffer from both of these risks at the same time. So why does it matter? It matters because we know that po poverty seriously affects the capacity to react and to be resilient to different climate hazards. So our point really is that we need to routinely factor in these dimensions into our policy responses, into our adaptation strategies, and become better at measuring and taking these things into account. So with that said, let me just wrap up. So what we try to do is uh, to synthesize the state of the, of the research, but also to give you a policy toolkit to act on this triple climate inequality that we've seen. Because we know that this triple crisis is not God given. It doesn't come about just like that, but it's the result of political choices and historical processes that we can act upon. So we call on you to do that, and uh, for more, please refer to the report. Thank you very much for your attention.